Thank you. Hello, everyone. This is Brian Flowers. I'm your cameraman today here at the World Chess Hall of Fame. And I'm here with our curator, Emily Allred, to do a virtual tour of one of our newest exhibitions, Dare to Know, Chess in the Age of Reason. Hey, Emily, how's it going this morning? <laughs> Good, thank you all for joining us. I hope you enjoy the tour. Yeah, well, let's get started. There's so many great artifacts in the show. All right, so I'll go ahead and start um, with a little bit of information about the Hall of Fame and the show, just in case you haven't been able to visit. So the World Chess Hall of Fame has been here in St. Louis since 2011. And rather than, we, we don't just have shows about some of the most famous chess players in the game, we also talk about how chess impacts history and popular culture. And so this is an example of kind of one of those latter shows. Um, during the Enlightenment era, which we've defined kind of roughly as like the late 17th century up to the early 19th century, chess changed from being a game that was mostly played by members of the aristocracy to one that was played by people of all kinds of different social classes. So we have numerous artifacts, not just chess sets, but books, prints, um, and other materials that kind of show how chess developed during this really exciting period in history. And to kind of get us started, we can take a look at this print, which depicts the very famous Café de la Regence in Paris. And this was a place where people would gather to play chess, to discuss philosophy, um, the arts, new ideas, and um, chess was kind of part of the social scene. It was a coffee house, and coffee had been brought to Europe in the late 17th century, and coffee houses were quickly established and they became a part of the public sphere, which was where people would kind of be able to discuss the important events of their day. On the left is Philidor, who is one of the most famous chess players of that era. And this fellow with um, the umbrella is supposed to be his teacher. And so these figures are all gathered around the chess board, kind of taking in the moves of the day. And I like to think of it as kind of the predecessor to what we do here in St. Louis, where we have all of these tournaments and then we do online commentary and so people can kind of see it, but now it's global. So if we wanna move over here, this is a case that has artifacts related to the Cafe de la Richance. If you look in the center, unfortunately COVID um, kind of affected the organization of our show. And so um, we are missing a few of the artifacts, but they'll be arriving later this summer. So this in the center is a coffee pot which looks a little bit different from the ones that we would use today. Yeah, I don't see those at Starbucks or <laughs> no. the local coffee shop down the street, not much. No. And then this book um, to the right um, is called Rameau's Nephew. And in that book, the author described the chess scene at the Cafe de la Richance, and he said it's where you could go to see the best chess of the day and have the worst conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's kind of unique because this isn't a chess book, but in that era, that was when we started to see chess publications come out. And we'll get to see mm. a really important landmark one when we get further into the gallery. So we'll start over here. And this is kind of the heart of our show. Yeah, I mean, this doesn't look like light reading, No. <laughs> so this is a set um, called the Encyclopedia. And it's a very famous publication from the Enlightenment. And its authors sought not just to create, you know, maybe like the type of encyclopedia you have at, you know, your own house, maybe not today, um, but it was one that in that period sought to collect all of the knowledge from all around the world. And of course, one of the things that's included in there is a chess set. So if you look very closely at this page, you can see in this entry about um, game maker or wood turners, they have an example of a um, chess set that people could made, uh, make a chess set pattern. And then we have numerous examples of this set, which is kind of nicknamed the Encyclopedia Chess Set on view in the show. So let me get this straight. This is basically a how-to guide on how to make your own chess set. <laughs> Um, in a way, yeah. It's, wow. You know, if you would turn us today, you can buy books that have like a pattern, but this is mm. like an example of one. And we oh. also have a print in the show that shows like 
a turner with all of the tools of his trade um, on his back. Maybe we can stop there at the very end. He's got a big piece of ivory. He has game boards attached to his outfit. And it kind of shows, you know, all of his trade in one um, image. And it's part of the series where they would go to different, art, like depict different artisans with all of their tools and products. Um, it's just kind of fanciful costumes. Oh, wow. Well, so, yeah, let's uh, go to that coffee shop and uh, start <laughs> yeah. reading. So these are um, different examples of encyclopedia chess sets. And so in the center is this one, and it's much smaller in scale than the other one we took a look at before. And you can see that unlike the other set that we looked at, this one is white and green, maybe more unusual colors than what we would play with today. Um, the green would actually come from copper verdigris as a way of dyeing it. And then the board that's paired with this one was made in Italy, and it has this very delicate inlaid ivory um, patterning. That's beautiful. Yeah, I always wondered why some chess sets are mm -hmm. green. That's yeah. it's not a common color. It's it's not something you mm -hmm. typically see in tournaments anymore or yeah, anything like that. Yeah, not today. Um, and then this board, I think, fitting for this show, which um, in the Enlightenment era, um, people were questioning the power of the um, the monarchy, organized religion, and things like that. So it has this theme of knowledge. And if you look on the side. The board is actually supposed to represent two books that are folded together, and then when you open it up, it Whoa. creates the board. So this is the history of England, but there are others that are all kinds of different themes. And then these shakers um, also go with this piece, and it has these tiny dice. That's amazing. That's amazing. For those of you that might just be tuning in, we're here at the World Chess Hall of Fame. And I'm here with curator Emily Allred, and we're doing a virtual tour of Dare to Know, Chess in the Age of Reason. If you have any questions for Emily while we're doing the tour, feel free to mention them in the comments below, and we'll be sure to ask them. Yeah, and thank you for joining us this morning. So this show we developed in collaboration with Tom Gallegos and Luann Wonis, Wonis um, who are both members of CCI, Chess Collectors International, and Tom is um, like an amateur historian, and he gathered up much of the material that's in this show, and a lot of the chess sets that are on view are from his collection. Oh, wow. Um, this is one that was very special to them, um, and we're also really grateful for their assistance with putting this show together um, because it's the oldest piece in this show. And if you look at the um, uh, knights in this Italian set, they resemble question marks, and they thought that kind of... Um, went well with the idea of questioning authority, um, creating new ideas, and things like that. Wow. If the Riddler had a chess yes. set? <laughs> that would be his. This would be the one. Yeah. <laughs> this would be the one for sure. Um, and we'll take a, a short pit stop over here. This is another um, one of the important chess books that we have in the show. And some, some of you may have heard of Caissa, who's, the goddess, who's considered the goddess of chess. And this is a poem that was written by William Jones when he was only 17 years old. And it was inspired by an earlier poem about chess. Um, in this one, he's talking about Mars who's seeking to woo um, Caissa, and she's not having it. And so he goes to his friend who's the god of games, and he gives Mars this game, chess, and Mars in turn gives it to Caissa in kind of his efforts to um, set up romance with her. Wow. So there's a god of chess, a goddess of chess. Yeah, and we actually name our big donor program here on campus after her. And you can learn more about that on our website. The Cayusa Club. Yes. Oh, so cool. Um, the show is roughly organized by geographic area, but there are some things that are organized by material or theme. These are all English um, chess sets in this case. And one of the more unique ones is down on this shelf, and it's called a pulpit set. And you look at the faces on this big girl chess set, and they look really grim. And this type of chess set was once thought to have been made in Spain, but now it's believed to have been made in England by French prisoners of war. 
and oh, they're wow. known for this elaborate decoration with these acanthus leaves around these kind of like little towers and um, these figures with their kind of leafy crowns. So before the days of laser etching, <laughs> yes. there were hand carvers. Yeah, I mean, today you can find all kinds of different chess heads like on Etsy and eBay because of um, 3D printing. Wow. So, you know, we've, we have ones in the collection that's everything from a breakfast chess set to Star Wars, Baby Yoda um, that you can find. But, you know, these are people hand making these with a lot of creativity. And I think that kind of goes, you can see that in this top shelf um, item, which is a Scrimshaw chess set created after the theme of the Battle of Waterloo. So there's Wellington versus Napoleon. And if you look at each of the pawns and each of the figures, they have these different faces, different facial expressions, and it's really charming. Um, you know, it's not something that is just kind of like a cookie cutter item. Oh, wow. It's, yeah, I mean, all of the, all of the pawns have different expressions, totally mm -hmm. different faces. That guy looks like me. <laughs> wow. And again, the green mm -hmm. that you mentioned yeah, that earlier. Yeah, green from earlier. And a lot of the other sets in here are actually playing sets, but they look a lot different from the ones that we use now. The Staunton chess set, which is the one that you can see in tournaments like the St. Field Cup and the U.S. Championship across the street, that hadn't been invented and wouldn't be until the mid-19th century. So you have all of these different regional styles. And you'll be able to kind of like pick them apart as we go along. Um, and these are more playing sets. If you look really closely, these are all um, ones that are associated with American presidents and founding fathers, as well as some really important chess publications. So in the center, we have a set that's known as the Washington set, and it's red and white. The towers um, have these, the brick, or sorry, the rooks have these individual bricks kind of delineated in red and white. Mm -hmm. Um, these sets were also associated with England because of the red and white colors associated with St. George. Um, we actually displayed Washington's own Washington chess set in one of our past shows called Power and Check, Chess in the American Presidency. And that was like a really special thing that, I think that was one of the first shows that was up when I started working here. And it's like really incredible to think about how these playing sets, you know, for surviving hundreds of years, how many hands must have played with them, how many games, you know, were experienced. And that's what's always really cool about these shows um, with our antique chess sets. Oh, I mean, it's, it's just stunning. And I remember that chess set that yeah. you're talking about. I mean, when you see it, you just can't help but think, like, how has this survived? Yeah. Just yeah. all of the time and the weathering, you know, not to mention the hands. Yeah, kids have... curious about their ancestors' chess set, things like that. Exactly. Um, it's really cool. Um, this book is actually one of the first, um, or one of the most influential early chess books about the game. It's written by Philidor, who we got to see in the print. Um, kind of in the early part of the tour. And he was not just a chess player, he was famous as a musician. If you go to Paris, you can see his portrait up on the side of the opera. What? Um, yes. You're kidding. No, no. Um, and so it's not, it's in this presidential set, not because, you know, um, the presidents contributed to it, but they were, um, Thomas Jefferson had a copy in his library. Um, Benjamin Franklin um, was in, an enthusiast of chess and he visited France and he went to the Café de la Richance, which was where Philidor frequented. Mm. So that's why we kind of have it in here. And speaking of Benjamin Franklin, he also wrote one of the first chess publications in the United States, The Morals of Chess. And this is what this is? Yeah. Oh, wow. And so rather than really being about like, this is how you play chess, this was more about what does chess kind of teach us, you know, what kinds of lessons, what kinds of skills. Um, he believed that chess taught you patience, being able to get out of difficult circumstances, not getting discouraged. But he also took a really lighthearted approach to the game in some of his other writing, where he um, personified gout, which he suffered for much of his life. Madame Gout um, 
is talking to him and kind of chiding him in this funny story about, you know, you're suffering this way because you go to France and it's gorgeous and you could be walking the gardens, but instead you're here sitting around playing chess every night. <laughs> so he had a good sense of humor, but he did believe that chess has really important values that it can communicate to us. I mean, absolutely agree with him. Yeah, yeah, that kind of goes with our mission here. So if you're just tuning in, we are here at the World Chess Hall of Fame doing a curator tour with Emily Allred, covering all of the artifacts in Dare to Know, Chess in the Age of Reason. And if you have any questions for Emily as we're going through this tour, just mention them in the comments below and I'll be sure to ask them for you. Okay. So what's next, Em? Yeah, so we'll go ahead and take a look at this little scene. Um, this is inspired by some of the taverns or coffee houses where people would have played chess. So we have these period newspapers a pair of spectacles, and these period glasses, wine bottles, candlesticks, um, as well as another French chess set all on this board and this beautiful table. Um, and we wanted to show chess in this way because, you know, chess wasn't played in a vacuum. Even though chess sets look really beautiful displayed this way as little pieces of art, they were part of life. And so we modeled this after some of these images of people playing chess that we have in the gallery. So oh, wow. here's one that's, I think, one of my favorite pieces in the show. And it's called The Chess Game, and it's a print with two different inscriptions, one in Latin and one in German. And it shows this group of people at night in the garden um, playing a chess by candlelight. And, you know, we have the candles here. Um, someone's bringing them some fruit and it's these women and men kind of just enjoying themselves and having a good time playing the game of chess. Well, speaking of good time, is this a bottle of wine over here? Is this from the yes, 1700s? Yeah, yeah it, is. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's just, and you know, another thing where it's like this is incredible that it survives and we have the chance to share it with our visitors. Wow. That's amazing. Um, That's amazing. We have a second print over here. That's um, a scene from a book by Goethe, um, an important German author um, and writer and thinker from the period. And it shows Adelheid um, playing chess with the Bishop of Bamberg. She's um, kind of a saucy lady. <laughs> um, oh, and she looks yeah, saucy. And she's got her pal, this little cat, <laughs> with her as she plays chess. Um, and she's later in the story trying to seduce one of the main characters. And so this is um, a print from that, a later, a later um, publication of that book. And you can kind of see, you know, this is a good introduction for her. That's beautiful. And this is a print, an engraving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is part of our collection. Oh, cool. So both of these are. Um, there's, the show contains loans from um, Tom Gallegos, who I mentioned earlier, as well as numerous collectors around the United States, and then even some from Europe. We have loans here from Portugal and Germany. Oh, so wow. It's, we're, we're really lucky, especially with all of you know the shipping difficulties that came in the spring with the coronavirus, to be able to have these on display and share them with all of you and all of our audience here in St. Louis. Oh, that's just incredible. Incredible. Okay. So if you're just now tuning in, we're here at the World Chess Hall of Fame and I'm with curator Emily Allred. We're doing a virtual tour of Dare to Know, Chess in the Age of Reason. If you have any questions for Emily while we're doing the tour, mention them in the comments below and I'll be sure to ask them. Okay. So what's going on over here? I see, uh, I see something that looks like a mortar and pestle of sorts. Yeah, so and then today we kind of take the field of science um, maybe for granted and but it was a brand new field during the enlightenment it was known as natural philosophy and so mortar and pestle was something you know that was part of this you know the tools that someone would be using in the period um, scientific um, like societies provided a lot of space where people would be discussing the newest ideas of the time but all of these artifacts are actually drawn together because they're from germany and so we have this really delicate German set on top of 
a really solid box board. Mm. And so you can see these tiered decorations, the tops that almost re like resemble a tulip or you know another um, type of flower. And then these really dramatically arched necks on the knights. Um, and then these pawns that kind of are really delicate towers. So with a chess set like this and many of the chess sets we've seen in the exhibition, I noticed they're very ornate. Mm -hmm. And to today's standards, tournament standards, you know, typically use Staunton chess set, of mm -hmm. course. So would these decorative chess sets be used to actually play chess or were they just merely for decoration? Some of them, like the um, barley corn sets that were in the president's case, those would be used for play. You know, some of these are actually playing sets, the delicate ones. Some are more elaborate versions of them that might have been meant more for display. Um, many of the sets that we're kind of waiting on for the show are ones that would be known as like a decorative chess set today, something that someone could collect as an art object rather than something to play with. And it would just kind of show, you know, your taste and um, knowledge and things like that because you have this really gorgeous chess set on display. One of the most important ones that we're going to have on view, um, I believe in August, is Catherine the Great's very own chess set, which is created from Amber. Um, and she is one of the enlightened despots. So even though she is a monarch, she believed in a lot of the ideals of the enlightenment. Um, and she created one of the first schools for women in um, Russia and things oh, like wow. that. So we're really looking forward to having that on display. And that chess set's one of a kind, right? Yeah, well, there are related sets um, at two museums in Europe, but you know, it's a really unique item. <laughs> Even if there are a couple of other similar ones, it's still, you know, really a wonderful object. It belonged to Catherine the Great. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, you'll have to let us know when it arrives. Yes, we will. We'll have to put it on social media. Absolutely. Um, so kind of speaking to the idea of science in the Enlightenment, um, we have some artifacts related. Oh, this is perfect timing to the me Mechanical Turk. And this is a f silent film from the 20th century, which kind of reimagined or imagines what it would have been like for this to travel around. The Mechanical Turk was promoted as this machine that just you know knew how to play chess and could defeat anyone. And so it would be taken around to royal courts, to different places across Europe, and then eventually in the United States. And so it, it appeared to be a machine that was moving the chess pieces on the board on its own. In reality, there was a person hiding in the cabinet, and so they would be moving the chess pieces, um, and they had We'll have some artifacts that would have been used by the cabinet mm. um, operator. Um, those are some of the loans that we'll have later this summer. So is that is, what you just described, is that over here in these prints? Yeah, so people would, there were authors in the United States and Europe who tried to figure out what was going on with the Mechanical Turk. They might have, you know, known that it wasn't, you know, this all-knowing, chess robot but they didn't know exactly how it would have operated so at the beginning of the kind of like show of the chess automaton they would open up the doors of the cabinets to show nobody's hiding underneath you know kind of like any magic show you would see today sure you know nothing in the box and they turn around they'd open these doors and so different period publications would show you know kind of like almost like this little show that the operator would put on. And then they would say like, maybe, you know, somebody could have been hiding in it like this or like that. <laughs> um, and there are whole books about it. Maybe one of the most famous people to write about it was Edgar Allan Poe here in the United States. Really? Yeah, he wrote a short story about it. So the person in the box would I mean, what was the reality of this? Like, how did it actually work? Was so, it, was it we'll magic? Go, was it AI? <laughs> no, no, it's a lot more simple than that. Or, I mean, nobody in the time period exactly wrote, you know, this is how this, you know, trick was run. 
but we can kind of guess from some of the artifacts that do survive. The Turk was burned in a fire in the United States in the mid-19th century. Oh, so it no. doesn't survive today, but we do, these little artifacts here do still survive, and they're um, at a museum in Philadelphia, the library company. And so this little, um, uh, the piece that has, this is a reproduction of it, um, these arrows, that's for a night's tour, and that's where it's, it's kind of, people still um, do this today in math as like a project, but it's, you're trying to have the knight go hit every square on the board without repeating a square. So this is a common knight's tour pattern, and they would have the, um, uh, the Turk kind of replicate that. So the person who is in the cabinet could look at this knight's tour pattern and be like, okay, I need to move the piece this way, you know, ah. on the board. And then this is a small book of end games on the right. And so someone could, you know, kind of study, have those out. And so then when they were doing these kind of like little end game presentations, they could um, have a resource. Oh, and then this little board um, at the bottom, that's how the operator could kind of keep track of what was going on in the game. And it's a pegged board and the pieces unfortunately don't survive. Wow. And you can see these are some more um, <laughs> images of, hey, how could they have um, fit someone in the cabinet, including someone hiding within the Turk himself. So there were a lot of theories yeah, behind yeah. this. Yeah, there are a lot of people who are trying to figure out the magic trick. Wow. You know, um, and it did actually inspire people who would later contribute to computer science, like Charles Babbage, who saw it, um, and it kind of made him think about machine intelligence in new ways. So That's even amazing. though it was a fraud, it had real world impact. And chess was a part of it. Yeah, yeah, and this um, chess set is the type that's illustrated in some of the views of the Mechanical Turk playing chess. Wow. I wish we had it. I wish it didn't burn. Yeah, <laughs> me too. But there is a really beautiful reproduction of it that was um, displayed at the Metropolitan Museum of Art earlier this year as part of a big show that they did about chess, or about all, not just chess automata, but different types of automata. Oh, that's so cool. Um, let's see. We can go ahead and take a quick peek at this chess set which is one of my favorites in our whole collection. And it's a Meissen chess set. It was donated to us by the family of Jacqueline Piatigorsky, who was um, in the 20th century, a really prominent um, chess um, philanthropist, as well as a prominent US chess player herself. Her husband traveled all around the world and he would collect chess sets at the different places um, he was a cellist, and so the different places that he performed, he would collect chess sets. Oh, wow. Um, and this is one of them. And this is a Meissen chess set. Um, it has this beautiful kind of floral decoration. Um, it's missing one piece, unfortunately. But it's part of this, it was created by this factory that made the first por porcelain in Europe. And they made um, the formula there. And so it still survives today, and wow. we're really fortunate to have it as part of our collection. It's stunning. I mean, yeah. you have to come in and see this for yourself. You oh, really do. Oh, for sure. Do. Yeah. So, so if you're just joining us, we're here at the World Chess Hall of Fame. We're doing a curator tour of Dare to Know, Chess in the Age of Reason, and we're here with Emily Allred. If you have any questions for Emily about this show, feel free to put them in the comments below, and I'll ask them for you. Okay. So we're getting close to the end of our tour. Okay. But we'll be able to um, take a look at some really special artifacts kind Ooh. of in this part. So this case um, has material related to um, chess and masonry, chess and kind of the occult, and then other games that were prominent at the time, including this gorgeous tarot card set. Oh. So um, chess was associated with the Enlightenment because, you know, it's played in coffee shops where you're drinking coffee, which sharpen your senses. Co chess has, you know, theory behind it. So it's, you know, associated with the rational. But then um, in the Enlightenment era, tarot is kind of 
associated with mystery. And so we wanted to include artifacts in the show that explored that side. Um, Masonic halls were important spaces that started to open up during the Enlightenment to people of varied social statuses. And one thing that you can see in many of the temples is this black and white checkerboard floor, which resembles a chess board. And so you can see this is um, a Masonic apron that would have been, it's kind of like um, a ritualistic um, garment. Mm. And so chess kind of has a part of it as well as these other um, mysterious symbols. And these are all elements and symbols that are widely considered, I mean, even to this day, to be related to masonry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, like the masons started as kind of like a, um, like a trade organization or, mm -hmm. you know, like where you would go to learn a trade, but then it started to be something where wealthy individuals could also join. And then it became one that was more open to people of different social statuses. And so they would go there and there, you know, like the different rituals that they do, but they would also go there to hang out and talk and things like that. Oh, that's so cool. I have to take one more look at these tarot cards. Yeah. So the one at the top in the middle, which I'm guessing translates as the Wheel of Fortune, mm -hmm. that pattern is on our exhibition t-shirt for the show, isn't it? Yes, yes, and it's really cool. It's one of my favorites that we've ever done. Oh, that's <laughs> but excellent. But we added some chess pieces to it. They don't originally appear on this tarot um, card. We also have a really gorgeous musical instrument themed chess set here. Um, wow. We, uh, Tom, who is um, associated with the um, curation of the exhibition, is doing some research about this piece, but he suspects it might be a tribute to Mozart, who is a member of the Masons, um, died at a young age. Oh, that's incredible. Um, let's go back to this set. Yeah, this, this is very interesting. Mm -hmm. I've never seen a set or a board quite like this. What's going on here? So this is the only contemporary piece that we have in the show. It's a chess set created in honor of the 200th anniversary of Napoleon's death. And it's modeled after his tomb um, in France. Oh. So it, the tomb is made of this beautiful red quartzite. And so the creator of this set, um, who's a fine leather worker um, from Canada, made it out of this beautiful red leather reflecting the color of the tomb. Um, there's this gorgeous decoration around the board. This folds open and then the pieces are all displayed within this, these drawers at the side. Oh, wow. Um, Napoleon died in exile and so his remains weren't taken back um, to France until later and then they were part of this um, uh, they were just, they were put into this beautiful kind of like casket. And so this is, resembles that casket. That's gorgeous. Um, these playing cards are kind of another side of the enlightenment um, and games. So we have a few different examples of how people may have had to kind of change how they created the imagery of games. Like chess is a game of kings. But in the French Revolution, kings weren't very popular. <laughs> and so, and kings also appear in playing cards. So if you look at these, um, the person who created the wood blocks to make these playing cards carved off, or tried to carve off, the tops of the crowns so that they wouldn't appear as kings. Oh. And this chess set um, kind of displayed in the back, most of the pieces are figural except for the king and queen, which for example, that other chess set that we saw um, in the other part of the gallery, you know, with the delicate tiered decoration and kind of like tulip shaped bulbs at the top. And in this um, playing card set, the kings and queens have been re replaced by enlightenment thinkers and people who um, influence enlightenment thought. So, oh, wow. Um, and you said these were, I'm sorry, these were wood, like wood block mm -hmm. yeah. prints? Yeah, um, so there are people like Jean-Jacques Rousseau here in the corner, who's a sage. Um, but there are also union, justice, other types of values 
um, that people were embracing during that era. That's incredible. Yeah, I love playing beautiful. cards. It's one of my favorite things. Yeah. That's, that's so stunning. Yeah, Tom and Luann collect playing cards and tarot cards in addition to their prolific chess collecting. So it's just a nice way to kind of fold in some of the other contemporary games into this show. Amazing. This chess set is probably one of the most uh, owned by one of the most famous people, kind of, at least in this show. So this is uh, Madame Tussaud's chess set. It's another white and green chess set. And Madame Tussaud is really well known today for her wax museum um, in London. But she started out um, as an apprentice in France. She moved um, to Paris, and there she became associated with the royal family. And she um, she and the person that she apprenticed under did a lot of work for them. When the French Revolution happened, she was in trouble because she's associated with them and people who are associated with the monarchy um, sometimes met pretty bad ends. So she was known for her sculpting um, uh, talent and so she would actually have to make images of her, some of her friends after they were beheaded on the guillotine. What? Yeah, so that was kind of some of the, the early part of her career was pretty tragic. Wow. And then she moves to London and she starts her own museum. And then this chess set is one that was in her collection. Um, and this is a letter of um, authenticity written by one of her um, descendants upon the sale of this set um, in the 1930s. Wow. That is stunning. And again, all, all hand carved. Yeah, it's beautiful, especially wow. if you look at the crowns, how much detail goes into them. Oh, wow. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. So we can take a look at one more case and then take some questions from people if we have them. Yeah, absolutely. This case has some of the pieces that traveled the furthest to get here in St. Louis. so. I'd hate to miss pointing them out. So if you look at this, these are a number of figural chess sets. The top ones are Geislingen chess sets. Geislingen was a center of ivory carving and they had they created these really distinctive little figures. We have one in our collection that's not on view here that has fabric hats on top of the bishops. Um, and they have these really beautiful decorations. Sometimes they're black and white, but a lot of times they have pink um, red, gold, and blue. Um, this is a different figural chess set that's on loan to us um, from Thomas Thompson. And it's a tin chess set that's painted. Um, it's a little different from the imagery that you might associate with typically with a chess set. It has these rooks with the elephants, but that's you oh. know a reference um, possibly to chess's origins in India where some of the pieces um, were, you know, elephants rather than, you know, uh, bishops or rooks or things that we typically associate with a chess set. And you said these are 10. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, check that out. And then this one, it, it may appear to look like stone, but it's actually painted wood meant to look like stone. And this is one of the chess sets that we have here all the way from Portugal. Wow. And so it's, you know, if you didn't know that it was painted wood, I think you could probably be fooled. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, if, if I had to guess, I would have guessed completely wrong. And so again, we have the green chess set color, mm -hmm. yeah. but now we have this blue. Do you know why it's blue? Um, there's another set that we're going to have in the show um, in August that's, um, Oh, I'm blanking on the type of stone. But these are two, like, it's modeled after two different types of stone, so I wonder if that was just a popular um, kind of decorative chess set type, and this person said, I'll make one that, you know, looks like it, but this is, you know, a more readily accessible material. Sure. Oh. Well, I'll take one of everything in yes. that case. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Do we have any questions? Yeah. Um, all of you watching the Curator Tour here at the World Chess Hall of Fame, do you have any last minute questions before we wrap up? All right. 
Well, thank you all so much for joining us here at the World Chess Hall of Fame. This video will also be on our YouTube channel, World Chess HOF. And if you'd like any more information about this exhibition or our other exhibitions, visit our website at worldchesshof.org. Emily, thank you so much. That was very fun, very informative, and oh, there's just so many stunning chess sets in here. You gotta come see it. Yeah, thank you all for joining us for the tour, and we hope to see you in St. Louis soon. Bye, everyone.